Hi, it's Mike again with Utastic. I'm here today at GoToConf Chicago 2013, and I'm again sitting down with Dean Wampler, who is one of those people that is, always seems to be ahead of the tech curve and, <laughs> and is a fixture here in Chicago. Uh, when I was first getting into AOP, it was already old hat for him, and when I was uh, starting to look at big data, his name came up, uh, you were recommended as somebody to talk to. and But I had already known you through the community because of your involvement in conferences and, and user groups. Uh, so, so how how does that work for you? Do you do you use the community to stay up to speed on things, or are you looking at things and bringing those to the community? Well, I'm sure it's both. Uh, I obviously like to talk about what I find interesting mm -hmm. and what I think people will find interesting for solving problems, um, and, and so that's kind of why I started the Scala user group, and, and have always been kind of active in the in the user groups mm -hmm. here in Chicago. I, I think the reason I like to keep up with uh, you know trends is both it's interesting right. but also there's a bit of paranoia there I, yeah. I've always been a little nervous about growing stale uh, and in part because it gets boring to do the same thing over and over again but um, uh, it's a little bit of that you know uh, I, I don't want to eventually get to the point where I feel like I'm completely out of touch with what's right. going on but I, I think also th this is a young industry we're still learning how to do stuff the kind of problems we're solving today in some ways, they're the same problems we've always been solving, but oftentimes they're very different. You know, like the scale of things is a lot different today than it was, say, you know, 20 years ago when the web first started. Right. And so, a lot of times, it's sort of a restlessness that there's got to be a better way. You know, right. yeah, maybe we're getting work done, but sure, it sure seems to be painful in some respect. So, is there a better way? And that's how I started getting interested in AOP as a way of solving problems that we saw in composing systems and. It didn't quite pan out the way I thought it would, but uh, you know now I've kind of seen that there's a lot that functional programming brings, in part because of the problems we're doing today are a lot more data-centric, and it's really good for that, as well as good for concurrency, you know, like multi-core and stuff. And then it just I like to be engaged with people, learn from people, and that's part of being you know out front, and also to uh, like talking about what I think is, is interesting and helping people figure out what works for them. I, I had forgotten about the Scala, and, and actually a little note for the audience that uh, you had spoken at a uh, Chicago code camp and, oh, yeah, yeah. and my wife uh, she came to she's not a programmer but she sat in your uh, <laughs> in your session and wanted me to become a Scala programmer after that oh, that's so, funny. Uh, she, she, she brought my notes and she took extensive notes and had a great time because it you you explained it in a way where you know she wasn't uh, a developer she still was able to grasp and, and it actually helped us in our conversations uh, I mean, <laughs> that's, not, I'm a marriage that's, counselor. Yeah, yeah you're a marriage said. counselor because now she understood a little bit better <laughs> about the problems that, that I face and, and what programming is when you're when you're doing it. But yeah. um, I, I'm just curious, like uh, when Scala, Scala was was popular, I'm just kind of going back in time a little bit. Scala was the next big thing for a little while for functional programming before Closure really, mm -hmm. uh, you know, got its legs. Mm -hmm. um, are you still in the, the Scala space? Is that still something you're interested in, or have you moved on to other languages? No, I, I'm still a big fan of Scala. I'm a, I'm a big fan of Clojure, to be honest. I'm a little torn between the two. I, I think they both have various strengths and weaknesses. Um, I tend to still do a lot of Scala because uh, it, it's like this great toolbox for me that, that fits the way I like to program. It does the, all the functional stuff. It has some really nice extensions to object-oriented programming compared to Java. That, address some issues that uh, Java wasn't good at. So I still like it a lot. I, I, I recommend people try to at least become familiar with both of them if they're looking for another language just to, uh, so they don't like, you know, just grab the first thing that comes right. along and then don't appreciate what other options are there. A lot of times these things come down to personal preferences. But, you know, it, once again, some, some languages are better than others for certain problems. And uh, so I, I certainly, uh, really like working with the closure community when I can, and, but you know you only got so many hours in the yeah, day. Yeah, there's so many hours, and you know you've you've over the years you've uh, even what I've observed is you know you were with AOP and with Ruby and uh, the Scala and now uh, Big Data. Now these are different, very different communities. If you made any observations about moving between these different groups about the way people approach the topics in their communities and, and, and how they meet and share information? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think there may be a couple of things that come to mind. 
One is that you typically see Ruby more in like uh, you know, feature-rich website development. You know, Rails, of course, is really drove pop the Ruby popularity. Not that it can't be used for other things, but right. that seems to be the, the niche that most Ruby developers uh, fit in. And so there's sort of a culture that goes with that. People that are more you know, maybe visually oriented, more aesthetically oriented, uh, tend to be there. And Ruby is a beautiful language mm -hmm. to, to work with in that regard. I, I sort of really got out of that community, uh, at least as far as active involvement, mostly because I, I wanted to get back into more server-side uh, general uh, development for more scalable systems. Mm -hmm. and, and that meant for me, anyway, going back to the JVM more, more uh, fully. And, and uh, then you know, it was about that time that I started to really get into functional programming, uh, learned about Scala and Clojure, and kind of uh, started working with Scala. And then, ironically, the, the Hadoop, uh, well, I, I did a lot of Hadoop consulting recently, and, and uh, that's part of the whole big data space. Right. And in a way, that was sort of a move, uh, deliberate uh, movement because I, you know, I, I did physics in school, and there was a lot of math that I hadn't used in a long time, but I kind of liked doing, and it was a way to sort of get back a little bit to doing more, more serious math on, on data. So that was kind of the attraction there. So what's the next big thing? <laughs> the next, that's a really good question. Uh, I talked a little bit about this in my talk the other day. Uh, it was mostly in the context of big data, but I, I do think that functional programming is going to see more widespread adoption. I think actually, even though a lot of people have talked about um, the like the multi-core problem, how do we write robust concurrency code is, is kind of the driver for functional programming, uh, at least mainstream adoption. I actually think that more developers are going to run up against a wall trying to just do data problems, like if they write Hadoop apps or or use some other tool. And I actually think that functional programming is probably going to get more mainstream adoption for that problem than for concurrency. Because typically in a lot of at least larger organizations, there's a few you know, really smart guys that know how to write the concurrent stuff, or at least historically this has been the case. And everybody else just kind of ignores it for better or worse. So I see more people running up against the need for something new with data problems and, and functional programming, in my view, is a better fit there. And the other trend I'm, I'm starting to see is a little bit more specialization uh, in that space. Like there's the so-called probabilistic models that they use for things like machine learning and, and predictive analytics. And like when you, you know, rent a movie from Netflix and they recommend something that, yeah, actually that looks like something that might be interested. And there's a predictive model going on behind the scenes. Technology to make that easier to, more, uh, to be used more widely uh, be outside just people who are real experts. I, I see that kind of specialization happening. And you talk about uh, also when you, your presentations seem to follow what you're passionate about at the, at the moment. Um, is that an intentional, like, you know, I'm, I like this thing, so therefore I'm going to dig deep on this topic and then do presentations? Or is it more, oh, I know that this is an interesting topic right now, so therefore I'm going to try to dig deep and do the presentations? Is it... Is it more of a push or pull kind of uh, <laughs> way that you you, you make make your, your talks? Well, it's funny you ask that because there have been times when I proposed a talk and something I really didn't know a whole lot about, but it was sort of a motivator to force me to make ah, the time yeah. <laughs> to learn it. But in general, I try to talk about stuff that I have legitimate experience mm -hmm. in that uh, I feel like I can offer some wisdom and help other people avoid mistakes or, or whatever. Um, and that's generally what I do. Mm -hmm. um, I do like to do public speaking and, and teaching when I've done training. So for me, that's it's, it's rewarding in that way. But uh, I think it's always interesting to talk with people and either one on one or in a group, or, you know, or in a more formal setting about you know, what seems to be going on, what seems to be working, what what's wrong with what we're doing now, what should we be doing instead. So it's usually more like experience driven as opposed to hey, I'm interested in that. Right. Let me learn about it and then do a talk on it. So uh, as, as an experienced speaker, do you have a process for preparing your talks? Do you, do you practice them? Do you write them ahead of time? You know, are you a slides first kind of guy? Or? I guess I'm a slides first guy uh, kind of guy in terms of preparing them. I guess I've done enough now that I don't really rehearse them that much. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes they're a little rough around the edges or rushed. I tend to, like most people maybe, have more stuff than, less, than yeah. not enough. Uh, but. Um, I kind of have developed an intuitive feel for how long I want to spend on each slide, and, and that seems to work out. And usually I'm too rushed to spend much time yeah. uh, rehearsing and refine anyway because we're all busy. But, um, yeah, so I typically will start out. I mean, s slides are kind of a great outline mm -hmm. format if, if you want to capture it that way, and I'll start with a rough outline that way and then flesh it out as I go. 
Okay. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to sit down with me. My really pleasure. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks.